Welcome to Lawmen, a podcast about local legends and obscure curiosities from days of yore. I'm Alistair Beckett King. And I'm James Shakeshaft. Sorry, I said that really weirdly because I felt like I was going to hiccup the whole time. Ah. <laughs> Did you scare yourself it's... into not hiccuping though? <laughs> yeah, you, scared, you scared me, you scared me. Were you so scared of doing bad broadcasting? <laughs> I'm recording this upside down. You're talking backwards. James, this has been a disastrous introduction. I think we need a record scratch. Yeah, do it, drop it. Okay. To be fair, a disastrous introduction is quite fitting. Whoa. This is a slow down on the motorway to watch this episode episode. Yes, definitely. This was recorded under duress. <laughs> no. <laughs> this was recorded. I had bags of jet lag. Mm-hmm. As I was setting up in the shed for the live stream that this is the audio from, my computer screen stopped working. If you're not a computer expert, the screen's quite an important bit. Yes. Because that's where the things are. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Icons. Yeah. All of that. Sometimes there's a picture of a field with a blue sky. That's where Clippy lives. Lived there, died there. Um, and He's buried in that field on Windows XP. Is he? Yeah. Clippy RIP. You look like you're trying to write a letter of condolence. <laughs> uh, uh, my brain was completely scrambled, added on absolute rage that i had that my computer had stopped working i think it was all i think it's quite a good episode it went all right yeah i think it's the first one we've ever done which starts with a sigh (laughs) and has no scoring really do your own scores (sighs) here's my suggestion james yeah You've had a, a bloody hard week, excuse my language. It was booming it, yes. You've been flying. Definitely. you jet-lagged. My suggestion is, how about I tell a little bit of a story from America and then you tell a little bit of your story from America and then and then afterwards, that'll, that'll be the end of the podcast. That's a good idea. How about that? Yeah, I like it. Just take a bit of the pressure off. Yeah. With that in mind, welcome to Lawmen. I am Alistair Beckett King. And I'm a furious James Shakespeare. <laughs> Still got it, still full of bile his, down here. His wrestling name, <laughs> Furious James Shakeshaft. Yeah, I think so. Or Colonel Panic. <laughs> Colonel Panic, did you just come up with that? No, it's uh, Colonel Panic is what happens to your computers when they go completely broken. You get a Colonel oh, Panic. Oh, very It's like wordplay, Colonel. It is a, like a wordplay. Very good. Well, James, I was thrilled to hear about America for the first time when you visited. Yes. And so I did a little bit of research. I found a very interesting story recently, mm-hmm. which comes from c- quite the opposite side of the Americas. Mm. And I was hoping we could set up some kind of East Coast, West Coast rivalry. Oh, that's a new thing that's not been done before. Good. I'm glad I thought of that. My little um, local legend comes from Rhode Island. (gasps) Have you heard of Rhode Island? Yes. It's not a road. It's not an island. It's not even an island. What a bunch of liars. I googled Rhode Island on a map. It is a state. (sighs) Most of it is landlocked. Most of it is, is land. And a small bit of it is island. It's like Road Dahl. He's not. A, he was neither a road <laughs> nor a Dahl. Nor was he a delicious lentil-based dish. No, you're right. <laughs> so the story is that I found that comes from Rhode Island are the many, many legends of the public universal friend. Mm-hmm. Are you familiar at all with the public universal friend? No, but I feel like I could do with one right now. <laughs> you're having a bit of a hard time. <laughs> Well, James, I'll be your public universal friend. Oh, thanks. The public universal friend has had a bit of uh, a renaissance lately because they were a legend in their own lifetime, a genderless Christian prophet and possible non-binary pioneer. Mm -hmm. The legend and history overlap in, in murky ways. What we do know is that Jemima Wilkinson was born to parents, Mm. Jeremiah Wilkinson and Amy Whipple Wilkinson. Mm -hmm. Whipple. Yes. Is that a middle name then? It was her maiden name. So she was Amy Whipple and then she married Mr. Wilkinson. She became Amy Whipple Wilkinson. That's nice. The only thing that would have made that better is if the mum was called Gemma and the dad was called Jeremiah. (laughs) She became Jemima, yes. Jemima Wilkinson was born, well, I've written in the 1752s. Oh, yeah. Well, around the, in the 1752s. It's more accurate to say, in 1752. And she was the eighth of 12 children. And her mum died when she was quite young for, I think, obvious reasons. 
Mm. Poor Amy Whipple. Mm. Even her initials, AWW, are like, oh. <laughs> that is basically the last thing I'm going to tell you about Jemima Wilkinson, because Jemima Wilkinson left time when she was quite young and was replaced with the public universal friend. Ah. And the public universal friend has no no gendered pronouns. And there's because every historical account of this refers to the public universal friend with female pronouns, I'm bound to get it wrong at some point. Rest assured, it will be scrupulously edited out of the podcast version as if I didn't make any mistakes. Absolutely. And apologies in advance. Yes, I, I, I'm going to apologise in advance as well. Not for that, not for anything <laughs> that we talked about. Just I. What time of day does it feel like it is to you with the jet lag, James? It's coming up for 1pm for me. Right, so it's lunchtime, but you've been up since yesterday. Y- yes, yeah. You. It's lunchtime okay. today, but I've been up since our English lunchtime yesterday. A proper English lunchtime? <laughs> since roast dinner. So from the records of the public universal friend, Mm. I give you a memorandum of the introduction of that fatal fever called in the year 1776 the Columbus fever. On the fourth day of the tenth month, on the seventh day of the week, at night, a certain young woman known by the name of Jemima Wilkinson was seized with this mortal disease and on the second day of her illness was rendered almost incapable of helping herself. And the fever continuing to increase until the fifth day of the week, about midnight, she appeared to meet the shock of death. (laughs) What actual disease Wilkinson had is somewhat disputed. What isn't disputed is that she was really ill. Dr. Mann attended her. Oh, no. Some say she laid in a death-like state, a sort of trance for ages. Some stories say she was actually Mm. placed in a coffin and was about to be buried and did the old classic banging on the lid. Oh, my word. One way or another, the body awoke. But when it awoke, it was the public universal friend. And uh, I'm reading from Herbert Wisby's 1964 book, Pioneer Prophetess, here. I beg your pardon, what was his name? Herbert Wisby. (laughs) So we've got a Whipple and a Wisby. (laughs) One of each, yeah. Uh, So he writes, The delirious hallucinations of her feverish, troubled mind were, to her, a vision from God, so real that she was able to record it in detail after she recovered. She was under its influence when, after the fever left her, she announced to her startled attendants that the old Jemima Wilkinson was dead and that a new spirit inhabited her body. This reborn spirit was to be called the public universal friend, whose mission it was to preach to a sinful and dying world. She called for her clothes and dressed, and except for this curious religious monomania, soon appeared to be well again. Mm. And that is by far the most generous account of the friend that I can find. The friend went on to oppose slavery. Uh, good. Yeah. And um, preach celibacy. That's fine. Mm. And built up a small following known as the Jemimakins. <laughs> That's nice. Very nice. I think that might have been sarcastic. But the reason I had to look to the 60s for an account is that all of the contemporaneous and 19th century accounts absolutely hated the public universal friend. Mm. 19th century biographers are all like, horrible woman tells devilish lies, or suspiciously attractive fraud pretended to be Jesus to seduce my husband. <laughs> that is, they're very, very angry about a lot of stuff. Basically, until recently, the public universal friend was regarded as a megalomaniacal huckster, and the rumours and folklore that grew up around them were just repeated as fact by almost everyone. Mm. So I'm going to repeat some of those legends with the caveat that they probably aren't true. Could I just briefly interject? I think this word came up maybe a couple of episodes ago, and I pretended I knew what it meant. What was the word? Monomania. Monomania is a, a specific obsession with something. Okay. Big, big time pop popular word in the 19th century. I seemed really literate there, and then I used the sentence, big time popular word. (laughs) If only there was a way of describing everyone focusing in on that one thing. (laughs) Alas, history uh, hasn't helped us out there. Unfortunately not. One of the big legends about the public universal friend was that the friend claimed to be able to walk on water. Mm. I'm quoting here from the end of Bertrand Russell, aka Professor Yaffle from Bagpuss's essay, An Outline of Intellectual Rubbish, which is a really good title for an essay. Nice. (laughs) (laughs) I admire especially a certain prophetess who lived beside a lake in northern New York State about the year 1820. She announced to her numerous followers that she possessed the power of walking on water and that she proposed to do so at 11 o'clock on a certain morning. At a certain time, the faithful assembled in their thousands beside the lake. She spoke to them, saying, Are you all entirely persuaded that I can walk on water? With one voice, they replied, We are. In that case, she announced, 
There is no need for me to do so. And they all went home, much edified. <laughs> that is, that's clever. And that story is repeated by almost everyone. No reason to believe that it happened. And isn't it kind of funny that a famous sceptic like Bertrand Russell repeated the story because it confirmed his preconceptions mm. about fraudsters? Mm. Mm, a, little of, uh, a little bit of irony there, Bertrand Russell. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe you want to look at the, uh, the log in your own eye, perhaps. Mm. Well, maybe. Mm. I move straight over to a section I've titled Nicking Husbands. A woman called Mrs. Rose accused the friend of trying to steal her husband using a, a classic, classic method mm. of sending a poisoned cake. <laughs> to the wife. Yeah. It took me a really long time to understand the story. Yes. Hoping that Mrs. Rose would eat it. It's a real gamble because what if the husband eats it? Yeah. Uh, what actually happened was, fortunately, a child had some. Oh. So no harm done. <laughs> uh, the child was ill. But did not die. Or fall in love. Oh, yeah. Oh, dear. It wasn't a magic love cake. Mm. Let's hope not. A second uh, occasion of husband nicking, a young girl supposedly saw local man Judge Potter climbing into the friend's window. Uh, although the way the little girl reported it, an angel was seen going into the window, although he wore the same buttons as Judge Potter. That's the kind of way that people identified people in the olden days. Ah, uh, buttons. It's, is this this is pre DNA, pre fingerprinting, pre dental records? It's buttons all the way, baby. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just like oh, those were his buttons, and also I could I could see his face and body, and it was him. Yeah, and he was dressed in long red, and he had this sort of white <laughs> wig on. <laughs> yeah, and he had a small gavel, which judges don't really have. They might do in America. Maybe they do. When Mrs. Potter at one occasion burst into the room, she found the friend mm. and. Mr. Potter together, and the friend said that the friend had been ministering to one of her lambs. Mrs. Potter retorted, Minister to your lambs all you want, but in future, please leave my old ram alone. Nice. Quite sassy. I have to say, the public universal friend preached celibacy and notably surrounded themselves with a supposedly beautiful young women. I just have to say, I'm really not getting massive husband-seducing vibes from the public universal friend. It's, it seems against their MO. The friend seemed an awful lot keener to me on the Potter's daughter, Susanna, who tragically died at the age of 22 on a day known as the Dark Day. Have you heard about the Dark Day? The Dark Day? It was like a mini year without a summer. How long did it last? Uh, a, a day. It was. It was. Oh, the, right. <laughs> it was the nineteenth of May, seventeen eighty. In the seventeen eighties, and uh, again, according to uh, Wisby, mm. the sun was blotted out and it became as dark as night. The strange darkness was not an eclipse of the sun. Combined with a smoky smell and copper, red, or yellow clouds, it lasted until about two o'clock in the afternoon and was a terrifying experience for many. The event is recorded in many diaries and journals and in the newspapers of the day. Mm. And for the generation, people remembered and spoke of the dark day with awe. And on that dark day, young Susanna Potter died in the arms of the public universal friend. And it's variously said that the friend knelt by the coffin hoping to be able to resurrect Susanna Potter, but was unable to do so. In some versions of it, they staged an elaborate hoax where someone pretended to be dead, and then people were gathered around in order for the, the friend to resurrect them. And then a nearby soldier said, do you mind if I run my bayonet through the corpse just to check 100% that it's dead? Whereupon the corpse in its shroud leapt out of the coffin and ran away. Again, these are obviously made up joke stories that clearly didn't happen. Mm. That leads me on to the, the final section. Obvious lies. Obvious lies. A particular Jemima Kin was supposedly heard, this is quite unpleasant, squashing a newborn infant between two mattresses, which is a thing that you cannot hear. Absolute nonsense. In 1787, mm -hmm. an account of attempted murder appeared in a Philadelphia newspaper. Oh, no. I've called it attempted murder, but a better description would be a dream at a religious meeting of the Jemima Kins, <laughs> Sarah Wilson and Abigail Dayton got into a scrap. It gets very EastEnders. That night, Sarah accused Abigail of sneaking into the room that she was sleeping in and trying to strangle her in the night. She escaped death only because Abigail became confused in the dark and actually choked her bedmate, a woman called Anna Styers. <sighs> Sounds pretty dramatic. Yeah. They asked Anna about that and Anna said that nothing had happened and it must have been a dream. And Sarah said, okay, but I'd better tell the newspapers just to be safe. <laughs> Obviously, nothing happened. It was a nightmare. But mm. the story evolved over time so that the friend, who wasn't even in the state at the time, was the one who was responsible for the attempted murder. <laughs> and if you like the sound of the public universal friend, you can buy a mask, you know, a, a, 
a COVID-19 style mask yeah. with the words public universal friend with benefits. <laughs> <laughs> Who's that joke for? Who's that for? Yeah. No one's going to get that. It's very niche. It's extremely niche. And from the sound of things, not what they were about. Very much not what the friend was about. At least on paper. Depends. Who you Unless asked. you ask Bertram Russell. So that was, um, yeah. hopefully quite briefly, the story of the public universal friend without benefits. That was a lovely story about the public universal friend without benefits, unless you ask Bertram Russell. Unless you ask. So I was in San Francisco, which is very handy for Yosemite National Park. Yosemite is the home to Bigfoot sightings. I haven't got any specific details because, again, the time I should have been preparing for this, I was simply sorting out the technical aspect. Mm. It's the home to more than one Bigfoots, Big Feets. The hairy boy. You know, the sort. Mr. Legs. Or, well, actually, the one in the video, the famous video, you know. The classic. Oh, I'm off. With the angry look back. Yeah. Um, that is yeah. most likely female. And um, once you've noticed why. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. Mm. You can't you not can notice why. Public universal friend. Yes. Um, it is most likely female, but it is also definitely a costume. Oh, yeah, it's absolutely a costume. It's 100% a costume. <laughs> but, the, but the attention to detail. It, you know how to make this Bigfoot better? <laughs> One word that I'm not going to say. <laughs> you know what it is. <laughs> People don't like feet. <laughs> what? The feet ain't any, even going to be in the shot. <laughs> There's a whole other cryptid based in Fresno, mm -hmm. which is an area. I thought that was a nickname for a place, but that's a real place. Oh, a couple of other things, actually. I've got a couple of other San Franciscan notifications <laughs> for you. Blimp. Okay. I didn't want to look it up because I didn't want to spoil the image that this place name gave me. But there is well signposted in San Francisco a place called the Cow Palace. <laughs> <laughs> Do you think you are fit for an audience with the Cow King? <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. Three trials must you complete. First, put upon your neck this bell. <laughs> dong, dong. So what do you imagine when you imagine a cow palace? What's your sort cow of... Cow palace. It could... I, I, I see one of those... You know the way they have medieval diners in America mm. where out-of-work actors go to waste away? Yeah. I imagine that sort of... But they're dressed as cows. Oh, so it's... They're serving burgers. As if the cows want to feed you burgers. Oh. Conflict of interest, surely. Yeah, surely. I wouldn't... I, I definitely wouldn't trust a burger that a cow gave me. No booze has pointed out. Cow King, surely Dairy Queen. Nice. Very good. Very nice. Yeah, I approve of that pun <laughs> very much. You're responding with the speed of like the, a local council when you submit a request. You just process it and <laughs> come back with a, mm. a sort of pro forma response. Your pun has been registered and yep. you'll, you will be receive response yep. in due course. Thank you very much. Yep. So, it's been seconded, uh, and I, th I, I can't see uh, anyone uh, raising any objections <laughs> with this one. <laughs> I asked uh, my wife what she imagined uh, for a cow palace. She, it was kind of a chaise lounge, but a, and a kind of a, a cow in a toga. Oh yeah, absolutely yeah. Type of vibe. Mm. Being fanned with grasses and then just hum, having a little bit of grass. That is nice. You don't need the peeling grapes. No. You can do it all with just one thing. Oh yeah. Nice. That's quite good of that emperor cow. Mm, efficient. Mm. Say what you will about the emperor cow. Very efficient. Very efficient with the with the um, cow staff, because I'm presuming <laughs> it's a cow society. I imagine it's sort of like King Louis' palace from um, the Jungle yeah, yeah, Book, yeah. but cows. Yeah. So less jazz, and it's a bit more slower, ambient music going on there. <laughs> There's already a little bit of excitement in the chat about the cryptid that you touched upon oh yes the fresno. fresno that it is a fresno night crawler that is a good name it's a half accurate name <laughs> what, in, in as much as it, it is in fresno it was first recorded and spotted in fresno there have been three video ings of it uh, the first one is in Fresno. The second one was in Yosemite, which is why I feel like I can talk about it today. And the third, I believe, was in Poland. Poland? Yeah. That's unexpected. That is, unex I, I that think is I have an unexpected the, twist. I have the Fresno video here, I think. And actually, it is quite creepy. You can just see... It's very creepy. Is, I see what you mean now. That it is nighttime, but they are not crawling 
And I don't think they could crawl because they appear to just be parachute pants, legs mm. with a head atop. Yeah. Those legs. There is something billowy and strange about the way the feet bend when they touch the ground. Mm. It, they do. They move. I don't want to sound like a sceptic here, but they almost move in a sort of puppet-like fashion. To me, they move like somebody who's got a really big pair of trousers that they pulled up to their neck. I did a bit of research after you sent me that video. Mm-hmm. The height that they come up to is about the height of just above the waist of a human. Oh, yeah. Because the trees aren't quite as big as they look. And if only there was such a thing as a less than average height human. <laughs> <laughs> like a human that only... Can- I know two humans, actually, mm. right now. I, I could wake them up. I could shake them and get them awake. Two humans that only come up to around waist height. And what I like is it's sort of CCTV. You know when you, know when you set up a CCTV camera and you point it at a small patch of path mm. that has nothing of value in it? Yeah. You know when you do that, James? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. From quite a low angle, like, like the height of a tripod. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's one of those general normal cctv cameras mm-hmm. that you would use that for that just happened to catch the night crawlers walking in a way that would be incredibly easy to do in after effects y- yes oh i think even in real life i reckon i could do a decent uh you think you could you could do a night crawl i could do it i could i could do a decent night crawl i reckon I don't know what... There is something scary, uncanny, unheimlich about that video. The way the legs bend Mm. is genuinely creepy. And that's why I I can think of a couple of ways that they could have done it. Mm -hmm. But the effect is actually really good Mm. because I thought like, okay, it's parachute pants where they're wearing one leg Mm. and then the other leg is a puppeted leg because I've just realised how boring this is getting. (laughs) It's surprisingly well achieved. However, the fact that it's an incredibly, incredibly low quality video means that I can't say with any confidence how they did it. Mm. But you could do it like six different ways. That's CCTV for you, isn't it? That is CCTV, yeah. Pointed at a path. It, they've got a real Mr. Soft vibe. Yeah, they they sort of, they bend. Mm. Yeah, that's what's, that's what's creepy about them as they go. I think they look like kind T-Rexes. Mm-hmm. There, well, there was a proposed link to a Native American um, thing, which was, it was obviously a lie because these are fake. And to someone said, oh, I think it's a, I think it's a Native American god thing right and then from the sound of it they are some native americans and they just went yeah yeah it's <laughs> actually it's an alien that is there to teach people to love nature mm. <laughs> now will you leave me alone <laughs> I, I made the end bit up in a sort of reverse professor yakult name he's not professor yakult is he what's his name <laughs> <laughs> mew, mew, good bacteria. I do love you. <laughs> Bifidus digestivus. <laughs> that wasn't him. That was the biscuit gang, wasn't it? Someone pointed out that our dynamic is Mulder and Scully. And it's like, uh, did we not pitch the show like that? Did people not realise that we're Mulder and Scully? Mm. I'm the sexy redhead. Yeah. And you're the sexy brown head. <laughs> yes. That, yes, exactly. I don't believe it. And James believes yeah, it. Yeah. And I've been stuck down in this basement. Yeah with the nickname Spooky Shake Shaft, and a poster that says, I want to believe, that he must have made himself. Yes. They weren't available until after the X-Files came out, so unless he's got a time machine... Exactly. It's really confusing. Well, I don't I don't think we're going to do scores for this episode because it was barely an episode. Oh, yeah. Would you like to score your trip to San Francisco? Yeah, I'd give it a five out of five. Very nice. And I'd give the amount of hours I've been up... <laughs> A 20 out of 24. <laughs> I must say, contrary to what the song says, this is my best dad joke from the trip. San Jose is very well signposted. <laughs> I only did that four times in the whole two weeks. Can you believe it? Can you believe it? I, look, we're definitely going to end the podcast on that joke. So uh, anything we say now is superfluous. <laughs> Well, there we go. There you go. If you're worried about James, <laughs> if you want to help him out a little bit, mm. you can join the Patreon. He loves it when that happens. Yes, I do. I would normally say, like, if you want more of this, <laughs> check out the Patreon. But if you if you want better stuff than this... Yeah, if you, if you want things that are up to our usual high standards. Listen to almost any other episode and join the Patreon for bonus episodes. That's patreon.com forward slash lawmenpod. And may the fifth be with you. You say that every day right in May. I've been been doing it for the past four days. (laughs) People only smiled once.
That was, yeah, I think I found the problem. Oh, okay. Uh, and I won't be doing that again, and I'm absolutely furious. Understood. I think we better get going. Hello. Hello. Hi, James. How are you? I'm all right. How are you? Oh, terrible. Yeah, I was wondering if you were going to lie, because just before we went on, I said, is everything all right? And you said, I'm really angry. I, I think said, I said, I'm it's... furious. <laughs> So uh, am I right in thinking that the the official lawman laptop, the law top, died just before yeah. this? Yes, it did. 